Hi, I'm George Poppy, one of the founders of Chaos. When starting a business, it is super easy to get lost in the details and not see the forest for the trees. So to keep my sanity while creating chaos, I've decided to sit down with other entrepreneurs to learn about how they navigate their own personal and business lives. Hopefully, you'll learn a thing or two along the way. You're listening to That Startup Life Podcast. So I'd love to introduce <laughs> Renju Boutalid. Uh, he's currently the associate director at the McGill Dobson Center for Entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is how I first met him. But yeah. since then, I have learned that he is many, many things beyond that. <laughs> um, he is someone that very much keeps himself busy with too many projects like yeah. I do. So uh, kindred spirit for sure on that front. But I, I wonder, was there like a moment like earlier on in your career, like in your life, in your career where you're like, I like, just have no idea what's going on? For a lot of my friends that knew me from, from way back when um, I spent a lot of time in at university and undergrad. I went to the University of Waterloo and I uh, started out in math and then I switched majors and went into arts, um, economics, because in my mind, economics is a lot more practical. And then I realized economics wasn't uh, very useful without context. And so I picked up a minor in political science. And then while I was at university too, I realized, oh, there was an opportunity to get involved with student government, have your voice heard. So I did that and, and I was really successful. I was VP finance for the student union. So I took a year off and, and I managed the, uh, like an, I was 21 years old. They, they gave me like $1.2 million yeah. to manage like six businesses. I was like, okay, this is a great like, experience. I can do this. I can do this, you know, but I had a lot of support, which yeah. is great. And then I uh, went back to school, um, ran for Senate. Right. And then an opportunity to like, oh, should I run for president? Because that was comfortable. That's what I knew. And a friend of mine, uh, Ilya Gregoric, who who was, uh, you know, I knew him from like day one when I started at Waterloo. He was building out a company uh, 2006, seven, I believe uh, it was called 8RSS. And then they rebranded to PostRank and then PostRank uh, got bought out by Google. Mm -hmm. And so he was the very first example of of somebody who was able to build like this company literally in his bedroom while we were in university i remember we went out for dinner one time and he was like so renji what are you doing or what are your plans and i told him oh, i think i'm gonna run for president you know president of the student body at waterloo you get to represent twenty four thousand students big man on campus it's, mm -hmm. it's it's a fun job right in many ways and then he's like well are you doing it because it's easy and you can do it or because because you really want to do it. I'm like, well, it's, it's there, so why not, right? And it was one of those things where the reality was, I think, had I run for president, yes, it would have been easy, but I would have just been delaying graduation mm -hmm. for another year. I would have been delaying, quote unquote, getting out into the real world and trying to figure out what I wanted to do um, uh, by another year. And so it was one of those things where he said, well, you know, based on what you're well, like what you're good at, what I've seen you do, you'd be good at business development. And for me, I was like, no idea what that was because I was, I was studying economics, but I was more into political science and I was in student government mm -hmm. and I had no idea what business development meant. But then the more I got into it, the more I realized, oh, there's something there. Now I'm at a point where it's like, I choose the projects I'm involved with carefully. Uh, I choose to say yes or no to, to certain things just based on like, do I have the capacity? Do I have the time commitment? Is this a priority? It's it's something that like I know I'm personally facing mm -hmm. so much right now where I literally had a conversation today where um, someone told me, it's like, you are literally saying yes to way too much. Like mm -hmm. you, you look dead. Yeah. Um, and even we had a conversation like last week where mm -hmm. you were like, you can't like <laughs> uh, put yourself on fire to keep everyone else warm. Yeah, um, yeah. You can't set yourself on fire to keep somebody warm. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it's... It's interesting, like where, what was like the first time like you said no to something? Like when I moved to Montreal, I was advising a startup based out of New York. I was sitting on a board uh, for a, a nonprofit arts organization in Toronto. I was trying to find my, my footing here in Montreal, but yet I couldn't fully invest in, in uh, being in Montreal because I had all these other things that were happening in mm -hmm. New York and Toronto and so on. And I think that was when I learned, you know what, 
to, in order to start fresh, I really need to start saying no to things. And it's super uncomfortable and they're all, they're not always easy conversations, but I feel like I had to look out. I had to start valuing myself. I had to look out for myself. And I think that's when I started to say, no, it's prioritizing. Right. So it's like key buckets, personal life. So like, you know, uh, got married recently. So it's one mm -hmm. of those things where that was super key for me. And then health, which I'm still working on, right? Like mm -hmm. it's stress, everything from like de-stressing, um, going to the gym, which I really should start. And I've had so many, so many people tell me about this. Um, and I do want to go back, uh, be more active, uh, playing sports. So that's, that's another bucket. And then I think hobbies, just like play for the sake of playing. I heard this quote the other day. I think it was Oscar Wilde. It was, we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. That's a really good quote. Right? It's this idea mm -hmm. that like play for play sake. And I have a really good friend, uh, one of my best friends actually, Nick, um, who always just values play for play sake, right? Whether it's video games, board games, just like going out there, biking in, in a forest. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's just like letting your mind wander because that allows you to not take on a lot of uh to, to, it helps you with, with de-stressing and then you know like now in my early 30s finances is something that i think a lot about i think a lot of professionals young professionals around our age you know uh are really beginning to think about so like trying to figure that out and i think yeah no um being able to understand what your priorities are and then having that rubric so when things come up and they're like oh it's a it's a nice, it's a nice thing to do, but does it fit with my priorities? Um, you have the option to say no. Mm -hmm. um, as I'm speaking, I'm also reminded by by something that a, a VC once once told me. They used to go from like an angel investor, right? So not even a VC, but an angel mm -hmm. investor. Uh, they used to invest in early stage teams, but with the idea that. Oh, if I invest in this team, this is what I could do. This is how I could help them. This is like, you know, I could help shape the team. I could help shape the startup and so on. But then they realized if they did that for every single angel investment they did, they would not have the capacity to do all these other things that they needed to do. Mm. And so what they realized was now when they invest, and I guess, you know, it comes with experience, they invest in founders. And the question is not, can I as an angel investor help them with this, this or that? It's like, can this founder figure this, this, or that out, right? Can this founding team make mm. this happen? So there was a lot there. <laughs> there, was. No, there was a question like, how no, do you no, it's okay. Like, I, I, that's, I, I do love the fact that I ask you kind of for milk and then you give me just like yeah. an entire cake. Um, <laughs> it's always, it's food for thought. And I've realized like how much it's all network based and it's just. Network and trust based. Yes. You know, um, just because like, it's, I don't think. I would have had even an inkling to how to move as quickly as I did without all the conversations I've had with all the entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it, for me, it's like very interesting just because like, I'm actually just, you know, up there as a storyteller most of the time as a contractor yeah. and I'm yeah. like in and out, um, you know, I'm not there day in, day out. So it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting just like, I can see like, I've kind of just gone in the splash of yeah. all that. Um, so I can only imagine what's in <laughs> cooking in your brain. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm working on a few things. It's, yeah. it's interesting because like, you know, in, in, in the back of my mind, I'm always working towards this, this one idea that I have. And it's, it's become clear over the years what it is that, you know, I want my life's work to be. I think for a lot of people, it's you know, search for meeting, finding their purpose and, yeah. and all that like, oh find your purpose yeah which it's is, all the millennial <laughs> stuff no no, like, but, but, but no no it's there, important. there's some truth yeah. to it but at the same time you know I, i'm i subscribe to this idea that like yeah passion is great but like you know I, I i believe that learning to work right is is much more important than finding the right work mm -hmm. right because you know oh i don't like doing this work because i'm not passionate about it well you don't really have to have passion to know how to do certain things or like to, to work right, right? Like how do you work in an office? How do you work in teams? Like as, you know, the leader of a lot of different initiatives, I know when to lead, but I also know when to step back because I've had all these different experiences, right? Um, but this idea that like this, this 
this idea of, of what, what is my life's work going to be? And in my mind, I'm like, well, value creation through like building ventures. And in my mind, because I have this lens where I'm the product of what is called, you know, OFWs or overseas Filipino workers, this idea that countries like the Philippines, a lot of people in that country have to leave to seek better opportunities. Mm-hmm. That's, that's basically it. There's, reality. You know, there's a yeah. lot of history there, 350 years, 400 years, you know, as they say in the church with Spain, 50 years in Hollywood with the United States has kind of left a really interesting uh, uh, cultural socio fabric makeup of, of the country in, in the uh, 60s, 70s, Ferdinand Marcos rose to power uh, and then ended up overstaying his welcome. So he became a dictator. Uh, As one does. Right, called martial law. Mm -hmm. And so uh, suspended the constitution. But while he was in power, somehow he realized that the export of human labor, Filipino labor, was something that was lucrative for the country because you export laborers outside, they remit money back in. And now it's like 26 billion US a year, Mm -hmm. which is like 13% of the GDP or something, right? Um, But as a result of that, you have people growing up outside of the country, you have people continuously leaving, and they're not necessarily leaving for better jobs, they're just like jobs that are available, Mm -hmm. right? Um, A lot of service-related jobs, domestic helper jobs, hard jobs like, like, on, on construction sites or on gas fields like you know not only are they hard physically but they're also hard being separated from, mm-hmm. from your family but yet i was in the philippines last year and i was at this event where some friends of mine were were launching this fund and it was interesting because they were launching a, a hundred million peso fund right mm-hmm. which is basically like a two million dollar fund in yeah. the u.s right and they wanted to grow that fund from a hundred million pesos to a billion pesos which is like 2 million U.S. to 20 mm-hmm. million U.S. And they were looking at supporting initiatives that were focused on solving complex problems in the Philippines. And, and what's interesting about the Philippines, like I asked, like while I was there, I asked a friend of mine, like, oh, why are there so many different startups focused on, number one, like disaster relief and disaster management? But then number two, interestingly enough, a lot of blockchain related mm. startups. And, and the answer that I got really surprised me. It was like, okay, so the Philippines has 100 million people, give or take, right? Over half of the population are under the age of 25, right? They all speak English. Yeah. So that's like under the age of 25. So you have a young workforce yeah. that speaks English. That's, Very, that's yeah. like compared to Japan, for example, where you have an aging population, the Philippines mm-hmm. has an emerging young yeah. workforce, right? And like they're set up to have a global reach. Global reach, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but yet... And, and, and mobile penetration, uh, both like dumb phone, but also smartphone penetration is, is high, mm-hmm. right? You go like to any of the provinces in the outlying provinces uh, uh, in the area and, and you've got in the country and you've got people on their smartphones and, and they're selling, you know, pay as you go, like buy the gigabyte data. Um, and so you've got that. The challenge is you've got one out of 10 people are banked. The rest are unbanked. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you've got this emergence of of like crypto blockchain startups in the Philippines. You've also got a central bank in the Philippines that's amenable to to blockchain technology. And then on the first part with like disaster relief, disaster management, you've basically got uh, uh, with with typhoons and tornadoes hitting the country on a frequent basis and climate change uh, becoming more and more of, of uh, concern, not just in that country, but, but around the world, um, you've got all these startups wanting to test their technologies, basically from drone mapping disaster sites to, well, when a disaster happens, how do you relay information so you can get help to where it's needed the most, mm-hmm. right? The right help, the right people at the right time. And so for me, that's, you know, that, that, that's another aspect. And so taken all together, in my mind, I'm like, well, if I want to, you know, create value through venture creation, it's this idea that I want to be able to, you know, get to a point where if I had a lot of money, right, let's like dream mm-hmm. big, I'd basically be doing what I'm doing at McGill, but, but in the Philippines, I'd be like helping to create 
and launch entrepreneurship center, right? Like, I think talent is 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 everywhere, but access to opportunities are not. So how do you create those opportunities, right? Um, help fund all these different initiatives that may turn out to be startups so that people can be employed locally, right? Um, I've always, you know, one idea I had was, oh, what if I were to create some sort of bank or some sort of competitor to any number of, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to say it like Western union type organizations, mm-hmm. uh, or businesses out there that charge outrageous fees for a lot of these overseas Filipino workers yeah. who send money back home. So like, let's say on a hundred dollar cent, they take like 6%. So that's mm-hmm. like $6 a day. That's and, insane. And just just yeah, yeah, no, it's like, I it's a large per- transaction fee large transaction fee, but like compared to what they're really doing, which is just sending conversion. Money, right? So, yeah. so for me, it's one of those things where, well, what would happen if, if that, uh, if they solve for that, right? And so you've got a lot of startups like actually like trying to take up yeah. the Western Union. And I use Western Union because they're the, the dominant player in that, in that space. Mm-hmm. Um, they're trying to take the market share, right? I think that's like where my mind is, right? So everything that I'm doing from helping uh, building startups, advising startups, uh, building an entrepreneurship ecosystem, um, maybe at some point down the line, start an investment fund. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know, right? Like, yeah, you know, it's again, it's you're throwing things, seeing, putting things out there and seeing where, yeah. where, 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 where it goes. So, so for me, it's like the goal is, you know, maybe I do it in five years, maybe I do it in 10, maybe it takes me 20 years is to eventually go back to a country like the Philippines, build and prototype, you know, a number of these different projects, mm-hmm. see where things go because as the world begins to shift to a more Eastern centric in terms of like localization of power from the West, Mm -hmm. United States to the East, China, right? Yeah. Um, The world's going to look really different. So how do you account for that? Mm -hmm. Then also, you know, you have a hundred million people in the Philippines. If things work in the Philippines, perhaps it might work in Indonesia. It might also work in Malaysia. It might also work in Thailand. Right. And then you've got, market opportunities in the global south mm-hmm. um but what do i know? i'm still trying to figure things out here but you know quite a we'll lot you, you you just laid out <laughs> some very logical observations yeah um and i think you write that there is a, it's ripe for disruption yeah and there's space to play now because um, yeah. yeah um i think one of my favorite things that i've heard from you um is you bringing up one of your professors from waterloo's definition of social innovation mm-hmm. um Again, I think I would butcher it, so I will let you actually do the <laughs> full quote. Um, but it very much aligns, I think, with what I think social innovation and entrepreneurship can be instead yeah. of like the usually just like feel good. So I'll let you take away the quote, <laughs> not so, to throw you under the bus. So no, 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 no. Um, so so I do have to like thank 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 two people. Um, one is um, her name is Cheryl Rose who was uh, like my first boss out of school, right? Out of, out of, out of Waterloo, um, who brought me on board uh, to join social innovation generation SIG, which was SIG at Waterloo at the University of Waterloo was led by a professor who used to be at McGill, uh, but is now a professor at Waterloo, Dr. Francis Wesley. Um, and she wrote a book uh, with the late Brenda Zimmerman and, and Michael Quinn Patton called Getting to Maybe. Um, this was 2006. So when I read the book, that blew my mind, right? Just like, getting to maybe how the world has changed. And so if you haven't picked it up, like I'd recommend like starting from there. And if you read it, you'll start to realize that's kind of how Renji thinks because that was basically a blueprint for like, oh, this is how the world has changed for me, right? Yeah. And so I got to work with Cheryl and Francis at, at SIG, Social Innovation Generation. And the idea behind that was that how do you bring all these different organizations together across Canada where, you know, 10 years ago, SIG, Social Innovation Generation, wanted to create the conditions for, for social innovation to like occur across industries, across the country. And the analogy that they use, that they, they use is this idea that farmers don't grow crops, they create the conditions for crops to grow, right? So like, mm-hmm. how do you create the conditions for, for crops to grow? So when I heard that, I was like, well, that's, you know, <laughs> a light bulb went up yeah. in my head. But the definition that they used of social innovation and you know, this was 2007, 2008 for me. So a lot of terms from social innovation, social entrepreneurship, social innovator, social impact, social finance. The, I want to say the challenge, like the problem, but the challenge is that 
if you don't really understand them, they tend to become buzzwords, yep. right? But they're like, fluffy. It's like it yeah. seems feel good. Yeah, and you're not quite sure like what you're, yeah. you're getting at. How does social enterprise fit with social entrepreneurship? What is social? Innov- you know, where where does it all fit? Mm-hmm. But what makes sense in my head is that the definition they use is social innovation was social innovation is any initiative, so a platform, a product, a program. Uh, that when introduced into a social system that profoundly changes and over time challenges the defining routines, basic and basic resource and authority flows and cu- or cultural beliefs of any social system within which it is introduced. Um, so that's a mouthful. So I'll, I'll break it down. So like any like initiative, product, program, you know, platform, um, so it's, it's really anything that when introduced into a social system uh, challenges like Challenges over time, the defining routine, so like how people act, the basic resource and authority flows, basically power and money, and then cultural beliefs, how we see things, right? And when I when I do an extended class lecture on, on this topic... Um, As I've seen you give yeah, many times yeah, at this point. Defining routines is, you know, when we were 20 years ago, when I was like a kid, right? Our parents basically said, don't get into strangers' cars. Right? Like we mm-hmm. don't get into strangers' cars. Like don't jump into cars. Stranger That's danger. That's the worst idea ever. Worst idea ever. Right? Yeah. Like, but you now, don't know who the driver is. You don't know who the driver is, right? You, yeah. You're just gonna be swept away. Yeah. But now we're like randomly getting people's cars every day with Uber and Lyft mm-hmm. and Cream and Grab Taxi and so on. Right. Sometimes we get into wrong <laughs> Ubers. We're like, oh, you're not my Uber driver. What's going on? Um, so, so things have changed. The defining routines, uh, resource and authority flows. So when it comes to like resources, uh, money like blockchain, cryptocurrency, it's like money and then authority flows power. Right? With the rise of social media, it's been a good thing, but it's also been, as we've seen with, you know, who got yeah. elected in the South, bad thing too, right? Like you've got the rise of like almost a lack of decency when it comes to like having nuanced conversations mm-hmm. about issues. It turns into partisan fight. Yeah, it's, it's become siloed conversations. Exactly. And then echo chambers, that you're listening to the same people, right? And, and and over time, you have this like view of the world where all of the other is the enemy, right? So, which is really harmful. And then cultural beliefs, like how we how we see things, right? And so, for me, social innovation is like this broad scale, like system change. And social entrepreneurship is basically using entrepreneurship, using this idea of like building an ecosystem, of startups to solve these complex social, environmental, cultural problems. So you can have social innovations that take the form of uh, a program like in the healthcare industry or in education, but doesn't have to be a social enterprise. But social enterprises, social entrepreneurship falls within the realm of social innovation because it's changing the way we do business. So I mm-hmm. find that like my understanding of that becomes a lot more nuanced because I understand like where where change happens or like where how the system operates and where within that system change happens mm-hmm. yeah. there's so many threads um i, I think i want to potentially like end on this where it's like you've now come very far since where you started yeah what is like one piece of advice that you wish you had known earlier oh man i know i'm really throwing you under the bus here so one of the things that I used to thrive on when I was younger was that I needed to be the president or I needed to be the leader. I needed to have that like top position, you know, and mm-hmm. but what I found was that I was literally like extending myself way too much. I was literally like putting myself on fire to keep other people warm. And, 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 and it wasn't, uh, uh, I wasn't putting myself first. Right. And I was also driven by this expectation that, oh, if people, saw me as this like community organizer and somebody who actively contributes, that's great. But at the end of the day, my job, like the things that were actually putting food on the table was suffering because I was more concerned with like vanity metrics, right? I think if I could go back and tell myself like this idea of like learn how to work right. So learning to work right is so much more important than finding the right work. Because if you're always on the quest for finding the right work, because you're fueled by passion or this this notion that, oh, the all the work the work that I'm doing has to be easy, um, 
And if it's not easy, then I don't love it. And so therefore I'm going to not do it. Like it's kind of like it, 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 it's very much like the starving artist mentality where it's like you, you, you love it so much and then yeah. you're going to put up with everything else being horrible in your life. Well, well, in a way where, it, or like you can correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but it's, I, I feel like that's no, kind no, of that passion. It, it, it's kind of like, I remember when I first started boxing, uh, in, in Kitchen of Waterloo, um, Sid and, and, and Lucas, who is also uh, one of the coaches there, um, basically got us to like really slowly get the technique right in terms of like just being able to punch slowly because, you know, you've got a lot of testosterone, you just want to start swinging wildly, right? Yeah. But the reality is if you do that and you don't learn proper technique, you're going to leave yourself open to like getting hit in the face, right? And when they tell you, you know, put your keep your hands up, otherwise you're going to get punched in the face and, and like up here as opposed to, you know, you mm -hmm. keep it down here, you're like, oh, I'm not going to get punched in the face. And then you get punched. You're like, yeah. okay, now you gonna, learn very quickly. You learn the proper technique, right? Yeah. And you learn the proper technique to like punch with like with impact. And you do it so that you go really slow. To go fast, you have to go slow, right? Um, I think a lot of people skip the going slow part. They skip the technique to like learning to work right because they just want to get like into the in, into the ring and start like mm -hmm. like punching, but they don't realize they're actually leaving themselves yeah. open to. They want to be hit. Mike Tyson right off the yeah. bat, but yeah. And then the Mike yeah. Tyson has a quote like, "Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face." Right, and I've been punched in the face yeah. so many different times, and it's just like, you know, you just get back up and, and try again, right? So it's it's that's like, I think that would be the piece of advice that that I would give myself. So like, don't chase vanity metrics. You don't always have to be the top dog, president, leader. Like that's okay. Let you know, learn to lead. Learn to like when to step back and others you know, step up and then, yeah, learn to, to, to work right rather than like trying to find the right work. I feel like that will come over time. You'll figure it out. You'll figure out what, what it is that you want to do, who it is that you want to work with. Right. Um, and you'll start to see patterns and you'll start to see certain things. Um, but that like, it's, it's really a function of time. Mm -hmm. And another thing too, my other mentors uh, told me way back when, uh, when I was in grad school in Europe, so uh, Professor Jim Skelly, I still remember this, you know, um, he was really interesting. So he was of age, I think, 22, 23, maybe 24 in the Vietnam War, the height of the uh, Vietnam War, yeah. right? Uh, and he actually had a case where he sued the Secretary of Defense of the United States um, because he objected as, as, as someone in, in uh, uh the U.S. Uh, Army, he objected to the, the Vietnam War mm -hmm. and actually sued the, the, and I think successfully too, the Secretary of Defense as a conscientious uh, okay. objector, right, to the war. And he was in the protest with the likes of Jane Fonda and a number of other mm -hmm. celebrities to like bring light to this war happening in, in Southeast Asia. Um, and then from there, he, you know, went on to do a PhD, uh, worked on you know, writing books, basically understanding peace building process and so on. And I remember we were in Europe and we were just like having drinks one day and he's like, Renji, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not any smarter than you. But I'm like, but Jim, you know so much, right? And he was like, well, yeah, but it's, I'm just older than you. When you read history books, like I was there. So I know it just by being there, mm -hmm. right? Like when we look back 20, 30 years from now, people are going to be studying the likes of Barack Obama, right? We're just going to know Barack Obama because, like, I grew up on Barack mm -hmm. getting elected. Um, and it was one of those things where, again, it's just a function of time. So that's another, like, piece of advice that's, that's stuck with me. It's just a matter of time. Like, knowledge is, you know, gain is a function of time, and you just figure things out as you go along. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this was fun, man. I'm glad. No, again... <laughs> I, I very much think this is the first of many episodes yeah. that we do. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Uh, again, first of many, I'm sure. Next time, <laughs> I will I will have you back once we open a second location. A second location, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll keep that right. on my radar. Keep, <laughs> it's going to happen. It's going to happen quickly. And once again, a special thank you to our guest, Renji Butalid. It has been a true, true pleasure. And we are now sponsored by Chaos. So if you want to find out more about how you can create content easily definitely check us out at createchaos.com that is chaos with a k 
And until next time, uh, have a good one. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Thank man. you for indulging. That, was... that felt good. <laughs> that felt really good. That was good. Oh, that was really good.